Well, today we're going to continue in our uh, study of the book of Revelation. And remember now that we have been looking at it a bit differently than maybe what you've heard before. Oftentimes, Christians, because they misunderstand what's written in the book of Revelation, they're afraid of it. When they read, they're like, oh my goodness, this is going to be scary, this is going to be terrible. But if, if you read in what it actually says, Jesus appeared to John, one of Jesus' disciples, uh, around AD 95, and uh, John had been exiled to the island of Patmos, and the reason he was exiled, because they tried to martyr him because of, of his belief in Jesus. But if you know the story, uh, the Colosseum was full, and they were going to boil John to death. And they put him in there, and he would not burn. He would not die. And so it just freaked everybody out, and they exiled him to the island of Patmos. And I don't know if you know this, but often the difficult things that we go through in our life, they have a purpose. God wants something not just different for us, but something better for us. And he did for John. And while on the island of Patmos, he wrote the book of Revelation. And if you read the very first line in the book of Revelation, it gives you the key to understanding and being blessed by it. It says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's about a person, not about events. And so often what people do, is they don't realize that the book of Revelation, uh, there are so many different ways of interpreting the, the judgments. I have gone and uh, online, I've given a supplement. If you haven't been able to watch those, go to YouTube, look up our channel and watch those videos. I spent 15 to 20 minutes ex explaining some particular thing that will help you learn more about the book of Revelation. Uh, but the reason that it is a blessing, and Jesus did promise to every person that would read it or hear it taught, that they would be blessed. Now, why is that? Why did he say you are going to be blessed? Because if you get the real theme and the real message from the book of Revelation, it's this, that Jesus wins. And when I put Jesus at the center of everything that I do, it's a blessing. And when you read about the judgments in the book of Revelation, there's no need to fear. Because the point is that God eventually puts everything to right, to, to the right order. That justice does prevail. We live in a time, and throughout world history, it's always been this way, where seems like justice gets messed up a lot. We look at things and we say, well, that's just, uh, that's not really just. That's not really right that that happened. And uh, we look at the legal system. We look at how people get away with things. And the point is, these Christians that this book was written to in the first century were struggling. They were being persecuted under the Roman Empire. And what Jesus wanted them to know was that he eventually does win. He's already won, but eventually he puts everything right. So you don't have to worry. And that is a great blessing. If you're being persecuted, just understand that one day Jesus is going to judge evil government, all false religion, uh, all evil and sin, and the devil himself. And so none of them get away with this. And so that should be an encouragement to you when you look at it that way that what we ought to do is to worship God. Now, today, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. Why we worship. We talk a lot about how to worship. We talk about singing songs, and, and that's important. Uh, we talk about raising your hands and how to get involved. We talk about life as worship. We talk about your work as worship. But today, I don't want to talk about the how. We all know how, because the truth is, you were designed to worship something, and the Bible is clear, we are designed to have a relationship with God. We are designed, as Billy Graham would say, with a God-shaped hole in our soul. There is nothing that can fill that hole other than a relationship with God. No amount of money can fill it. We all read about people that are extremely wealthy, but extremely empty. And I know some of you are like, well, I would like to try that extremely wealthy part and see if I would be empty or not. Well, no matter how much money you have, 
um, that cannot replace a relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing wrong with being wealthy. But there's everything wrong with worshiping what was never intended by God to be worshiped. Now, either we worship God or we will worship the creation or the creature. In other words, we'll worship ourselves or we will worship something that God never intended to be worshiped, but rather given to us as a blessing. And so what you and I must learn to do is why we worship God and and in worshiping him that we understand that he is worthy of worship. Now, and I really believe this, uh, we are incomplete without a personal relationship to and the worship of God. Now, no matter who you are, no matter how successful you are, no matter what you accomplish in life, you and I are incomplete apart from a relationship with God. Because nothing, no amount of success, no amount of money, no amount of relationships, none of that can fill that void that God has placed in us. And so today, we're going to see what Jesus himself said about worshiping the Heavenly Father. Now, the interesting thing is, in the book of Revelation, it always points to Jesus. He is worthy. He is going to be worshiped. He is the King of kings. He is uh, the Lamb of God. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the coming, returning warrior king that is going to conquer. Okay, he's going to reign one day, and eventually everything is turned over to him. In fact, Jesus said, after he resurrected, he said to his disciples, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, we're to go. We are to make disciples. We are to reach people. We're to spread the gospel. Why? Because Jesus has all power. He is worthy. Now, the interesting thing is what we're going to read today, it says to worship the Father, the Heavenly Father. Now, you say, why would it say that? Well, because we have a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and this one God uh, is manifested in three persons. So we're going to read today Revelation chapter 4. We're going to read 11 verses, and I want you to pay close attention to the things that are said about why we are to worship God. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. I'll explain that in a moment. This is interesting of the choice of words and the choice of stones. It looked like an emerald green flowing from, emanating from the throne of God. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the, 20, on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with gold crowns on their head. These are simply representatives of God's people. It represents you and me. And the fact is, we are going to be able to worship God. We're going to have direct access to God. Can you imagine that the blessing that is going to come your way when we get to heaven and we literally are able to talk face to face with Jesus? We're going to be able to hug his neck. I mean, he's real. He's got a resurrected body. And there's not going to be a line because there will be no time and space like we understand it now. But you're going to be able to have access to him all the time. Isn't that amazing? You're going to be able to see Jesus and talk with him and, and know him. And it's just going to be incredible. And so these, these elders represent you and me. And it said, uh, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire. Remember, seven represents completion. It's the number of God which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature, 
like an eagle in flight. Now, don't you feel closer to Jesus after having read that? Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Okay, I'm going to explain what that means in a moment, so don't worry. It says, in the four living creatures, each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the God over history. He is the God over everything that has ever happened, over what is happening now, and what is going to happen in the future. So we, can, we don't have to worry. We can rest in him. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Well, I want to just show you three thoughts. I want to just organize this today so that we understand why we worship God. What is the real reason? And we can come up with all kinds of reasons But in this passage of Scripture, it shows us exactly why we are to worship God. Um, There are many things that can be said, but I just want to say three things, okay? Number one, why do we worship God? We worship God because of God's person, because of his person. You say, what do you mean by that? What we're talking about is character, his attributes. And it's a mistake for us. Nothing wrong with us worshiping God and thanking God for what he does for us. In fact, you ought to worship God because of what he does. But that can't be the extent of your worship. We don't just worship God for what he does. Because the great temptation there is this. When things are going well in your life, then you want to worship him. You want to praise him. You want to thank him. But when things are not going well, are you still able to praise him? Just this past week, I read the book of Job. And the book of Job, it talks about this. Job was... He, he thought he was living his life for God. He thought that he was doing what God wanted him to do. And suddenly, tragedy struck. He lost everything that he owned. He lost all 10 of his children, and he lost his health. And even his wife, she looked at him, she said, why don't you curse God and die? Everything in his life went wrong. And yet we know in the end of the book that Job realized that God is in control and that he is to be worshiped. And he, he made this statement. He asked this question of his friends. Will we take the good things from God and not the evil things? Will we take the blessings from God and not what seems to be not so much of a blessing in our life? And the point is this. You don't worship God simply because of his good deeds. You should worship him because of his good deeds. He is good. But we worship him because of who he is. We worship him because of his character. He is the creator. And I love how it said that, that he created all things. The four creatures, which are reflected by the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle that we just read, they represent the four corners of the zodiac and tell us that God is both creator and Lord of the universe. So it represents the universe, what God created. So you could say that these creatures represent the fact that God is Lord of all. It can also represent the entire created order and show that God is all. So we worship him because he's creator. And if you have questions about the book of Genesis, for example, about what God did, understand this. God created everything. God created everything. And he is Lord over all. And if you have questions about the days of creation, you have questions about the length of time, I'm happy to talk with you after the service or uh, some other time. But the truth is, God created everything that there is. He is Lord over creation. And he is also holy and righteous. The sea of glass, this is interesting, represents God's purity and holiness. It can also represent, in the Old Testament especially, uh, the idea of a sea would represent evil. And notice that God was Lord over that. 
These things were at his feet. And so uh, listen to what Ezekiel 1.22 says. It says, over the heads of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse shining like awe-inspiring crystal spread out above their heads. So God is superior over all of creation. He is superior over everything. And Jesus has defeated sin. It is at his feet. Listen to what it says in Psalm 29, verse 10. The Lord rules over the deep waters. He rules as king forever and ever. So why do we worship God? We worship him because of his person. He is creator. He is holy and righteous. He is everlasting. It said in this passage that we read, he is forever and ever. He is from eternity past to eternity future. Now, you and I probably have a difficult time grasping that. And let me just explain it the best way that I can. The fact is, God never had a beginning and he will never have an end. That's eternity. But the way we understand that is that God is above or over or outside of time and space. He created this universe, therefore it is material, but God is outside of that. So the way that you and I can even remotely try to grasp the fact that God is eternal is that here's his creation, he stands outside of it. He is above it, he is over it. He is Lord of all. Why do we worship him? Because he's Lord. He is everlasting and he is all-knowing and has a divine purpose. We read about the eyes uh, that cover these creatures. And, and I really do believe that this represents the power of God, the omniscience of God, that God knows. Now I want you to just take a moment and reflect on that thought that God is omniscient. In other words, he, he knows everything. And the Bible is clear that he knows every thought we have he knows every decision we're ever going to make. He knows what we are going to do and think before we ever do it. And yet, he loves us. Isn't that amazing? And, and so what it tells me is this, and I want you to think about this. No matter what it is that you're going through, he knows. He knows. He, he is not uh, some, you know, far off deity that is not involved in our lives. He's not complacent. But he knows. He knows everything that we go through. He knows every temptation that we have. In fact, it said about Jesus that he was tempted like we are, yet he was without sin. Therefore, because of that, the Bible says in Hebrews, we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And God knows. He knows your pain. He knows your struggles. He knows your fears. He knows that tomorrow, we're speaking metaphorically, that tomorrow is going to be a better day for you. One day when you go to heaven, it's all going to be behind you. All the toil and the pain and the suffering, none of that will be anymore. And he knows that one day you'll be with him in eternity if you're a believer, a follower of Christ. And for all of eternity, there'll be no more tears, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more regrets. And for all of eternity, you know what you're going to do? You're just going to be a recipient of the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ. And he's just going to pour out, and I love you here, and I love you here, and I love you in this way, and I love you in this way. And here's more grace, and here's some more grace. And just without end, we are going to be recipients of the love and the grace of God. Because that is why you were created. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I want you to listen to me. The truth is, there are a lot of people that say, well, I don't like religion. I'll be honest, Jesus doesn't like religion either. The fact is, I know you can say, well, Christianity is a religion, but uh, it's not a religion. It is a relationship with God. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the truth is, apart from Christ, there is no hope. If you're an atheist, what hope do you have? 
What reason do you have? If you're an atheist, how can you possibly say that there is right and wrong in the universe? Because if there is no God, there is no moral absolute. There is no right and wrong. And you cannot say that what Hitler did was wrong. You cannot say that abusing a child is wrong because if if there is no God, then it means that there is no moral absolute. There is no reality when it comes to right and wrong. And therefore, what may be wrong for you may not be wrong for me. What hopelessness. What a terrible way to live. Living life as if there is nothing more than this. The Apostle Paul wrote about this in 1 Corinthians. He said that if there's not a resurrection, if there's not life after death, we are of all people most miserable. Because the truth is, our hope lies in Jesus Christ. So for those of you that have never trusted him, it's not about rules keeping. It's not about checking the religious boxes. It is about receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It is about a relationship. We hear that kind of terminology a lot, but it's about saying yes to God. It's about opening up your heart to the possibility that God loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And when I say yes to him, when I open my life to him, then everything in eternity opens up. And the ability to worship God because of who he is, because he saves, because he's holy, because he's righteous, because he has a purpose for my life, it completely transforms my life. And that's why the Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past and the new has come. You see, what God wants to do in your life is to help you fulfill your purpose. God created you to love you forever. Jesus wants to have a relationship with you, and you can say yes to him today, and that's the good news. That is the good news. Well, why do we worship God? Well, because of God's person, but then because of God's promises. Aren't you glad that God gives us promises? Aren't you glad that God never, ever, ever breaks his promise? I'm so happy about that. He promises salvation The jasper is known as the bloodstone. Very interesting that in this passage it says that there was jasper. That's also in the walls uh, mentioned in chapter 21 and the foundational stones. Jesus has shed his blood for our salvation. I just think the symbolism is incredible there. That around him is the bloodstone. And the way we have access to the Father is through the blood of Jesus Christ. The sea of glass invokes the image of the laver in Solomon's temple, which represented the washing away of our sins. Um, And it also uh, shows that Jesus is the water of life. So don't be freaked out about any of this imagery. By the way, one thing you need to understand that in reading the Bible, we read it in its normal sense, okay? Uh, You read it, you'll know when there's a metaphor and when there isn't, okay? Uh, And there's a lot of imagery in the book of Revelation. You need to understand that. How else would a person that lived in 95 AD describe maybe a vision he saw of a war with modern military equipment, with flying machines that fly through the air, with tanks that shoot, with artillery, with atomic warfare? How else would they describe it other than maybe the way he described it in the book of Revelation? So you need to understand that When you read metaphor, uh, that you understand what it is, sometimes metaphor, even though it is a metaphor, it gives an incredible truth. For example, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And what that means is that Jesus sustains us. It is through him that we have life. Nobody thinks that Jesus is actually a loaf of bread. Jesus said, I am the door. Nobody thinks Jesus is made out of wood and has a door handle on his side. But he's saying that you have access to the heavenly father through me. I'm the way. And so when we read these incredible truths, sometimes they may be in symbolic language. But when he talks about the sea of glass, Jesus is the water of life. 
uh, the Bible is clear that Jesus washes away our sin. Jasper being the bloodstone, the way we get to uh, the Father and have access to him is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It also can represent the crossing of the Red Sea, which is a picture of God's deliverance and God's salvation in our lives. So it's beautiful. God promises salvation. He promises to live with us. Jasper and Carnelian are connected to the glory of God. They represent God's glory and his intimate presence dwelling with his people. Uh, It's also in the walls and the foundation of the new Jerusalem. Um, He promises to restore. The thrones mentioned represent God's new creation in chapter 21. And every one of us, if you've, been a, uh, if you've become a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've been saved, guess what you are? You are a new creation. And the language here lets us know that when we go to heaven, we're not going to be sitting around on a cloud strumming a harp. I don't know about you, but that does not sound like heaven to me. That sounds like torture. You know, maybe hell is them sitting around on a cloud, strumming a harp, listening to harp music for all of eternity. Now, I know that the harp can be beautiful, but I don't want to listen to it all the time, especially for eternity, all right? But the point is, we're going to worship God. We're going to be active. We're going to serve God in heaven. We're going to be a recipient of his love. We're going to get to know him better and better and better. And it is going to be the most incredible thing that you and I have ever experienced. In fact, the apostle Paul wrote it this way. He said, eyes not seen, ears not heard, and it hasn't even entered into the heart of man. In other words, you can't even conceive of how good it's going to be. And I believe, and and I'm going to preach on heaven in the last message of this series, but I believe in heaven, we're not going to just sit around doing nothing, twiddling our thumbs. We're going to have Food like you've never had before. Now, I don't know about you, but I like food. I know you can't tell by looking at me, okay? Uh, But, you know, I don't eat just because I have to choke it down to live. I love food. Can I get an amen? Is anybody like that here today? I don't know what your favorite meal is. I I have a lot of them, okay? Uh, I love ice cream. I don't know why ice cream is so good. But it is, if, it, if I just rubbed it on my forehead, my tongue would beat my brains out trying to get to it. It's so good. There are a lot of things. I, I love a good grilled burger, uh, grilled out. Oh, man, it's so good. But no matter what your favorite food is, listen to this. You will have tasted nothing, nothing. Think of the best meal you've ever had and multiply it times a million. That's how good it's going to taste. Can you imagine that? I mean, you're going, to take a, you're going to take a bite of that food at the Mary's Supper of the Lamb, and I'm not quite sure, I can't prove this from the Bible, but I think when you take that bite, that first bite, you're just going to like float up off the ground. It's so good. You're just going to be like, whoo, this is so good. I believe the best art will be in heaven. I believe the best music will be in heaven. I believe the best creativity will be in heaven. What am I saying? God promises to be with us. He promises to restore, and he promises his grace. I love this. Uh, The living creatures bring to mind the cherubim on the cover of the Ark of of the Covenant. God's covenant with us is one of his faithfulness, his grace, and his mercy. God keeps his promises. He promised salvation The elders probably represent God's people. In the Old Testament, there were 24 courses of priests. In other words, 24 different groups that served at the temple or the tabernacle before that. And so I believe that it represents us, a kingdom of priests, of kings, and the white robes represent victory. Why do we worship God? His power, His promises. And finally, uh, or his person, his promises, finally his power. His power. Let me just show you uh, the colors there. 
Remember we read about the, the look like green, like an emerald? Um, this represents the sovereignty of God, the majesty and glory of God. Scientists have discovered, I want you to get this, that there are certain types of stones that give off light. In other words, they will glow after they have been exposed to intense light. Would you like to know which ones, which stones are like that? It's the ones that are in the foundation of the New Jerusalem. It's the ones that are around the throne of God. They will literally glow because Jesus said that he is the light and that there will be no more need for the sun because he is the light that lights everything for us in eternity. Well, um, the four creatures reflected by the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, that represents the four corners of the earth. It represents all creation. Um, God made a covenant of mercy with Noah, the man, and the beasts, the lion, uh, the fowl, the eagle, and the cattle. Genesis 9, 9, and 10. Listen to the promises he made. He even keeps his promises to the animals. Listen to what he said. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as come, uh, came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. God is a promise keeper. He has great, great power. Some students see that the four faces described in, four, in Revelation 4, 7 as an illustration of the fourfold picture of Jesus Christ given in the Gospels. Um, in Matthew, it's the Gospel of the King, and that is the lion, that the lion represents the king. In the Gospel of Mark, it emphasizes the servant aspect of Jesus' ministry. That's the calf, represented by the calf. Uh, Luke presents Christ as the uh, compassionate son of man. That's the face of the man. And then John magnifies the deity of Christ, the Son of God, as the eagle. Jesus told us that why we worship, we worship because of who God is, his person. We worship him because of his promises. He keeps his promises. And we worship him because of his power. He has the power to change your life. He has the power to answer prayer. And he is a God who loves you beyond measure. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help all of us to see the incredible power of Jesus, the incredible power of God. And, and Lord, I, I pray that you'd help us to worship you. This is the why, not just how, but why we worship you. And Lord, I pray that today there will be people that follow you as Savior here in the room and online. And God, I pray that you just hear and answer our prayer. For it's in Jesus' name I pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.